Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Novak and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Kondua Sande is a policeman at the Machinga Police Station in Malawi. The 42-year-old also has a love for sports. So, he has worked for the last 10 years to create a sports center with areas like a track, netball court, and climbing walls for children. Sunday says the aim is to help develop sports and reduce crimes such as rape and sexual assault in his community. One of our responsibilities as police officers is also to reduce crime, to prevent people from doing crime, he said. So, when one is idle, surely that person will indulge him or herself in other bad behaviors like committing crimes. Sunday has been doing his volunteer work since 2011. He uses savings from his monthly wages and works at the sports center during his free time. I don't spend my lunch hour, one hour and thirty minutes, eating only, Sunday said. No, I also work for maybe fifty minutes. Every day of my lunch hour is sacrificed for voluntary work. Over the years, Sunday ignored comments from people who did not understand the reasons behind all of his work. Some called him crazy. He asked his wife to also ignore them. Sunday said, Because I knew people would say so many things to my wife. Are you allowing this one to do this job? Are you married to this person, this mad person? So I said, don't tell me anything you hear from other people that will derail me from doing this. In 2017, his volunteer work earned him an Innovation Award for sports. He was sent on a month-long visit to China, where he learned how best to continue working on the sports center. Soon after, he bought and began using machinery to speed up the project. Government sports officials and community leaders sometimes visit the center to express thankfulness for the work he is doing. Sunday said the sports center is now nearly complete and expected to officially open to the public at the end of December. Ana Paula Sosa, her husband, and their young son are among the hundreds of families that have left the small Brazilian town of Alpercata in recent months. Alpercata is home to about 7,500 people. It is in Brazil's southeastern state of Minas Gerais. People have left the area to come to the United States for many years, but the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly weakened the economy. Now, people are leaving almost daily. The town's local bakery does not have enough workers. Government employees have quit their jobs. Local soccer teams are out of players. Alpercata is emptying out, said Souza, who is 23 years old. Everyone is leaving. Sosa now lives in Orlando, Florida. She has a job at a bakery. 
Her husband is working in the building industry. Many people are leaving Alpercata and other nearby towns because of the effects of the pandemic. COVID-19 has killed more than 600,000 people in Brazil. In Latin America overall, there has been an increase in immigration to the U.S. The area has been hit hard by the virus. Record numbers of Brazilians, Haitians, and Venezuelans are appearing at the southern U.S. border. Brazilians ranked sixth among the nationalities detained at the border between October 2020 and September 2021, data from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, show. A record 56,735 Brazilians were stopped. Earlier waves of migration were mostly poor young men who quickly returned home. But this wave is bringing professional workers that are harder for Brazil to replace, officials told the Reuters news agency. Nurses, engineers, and even city officials are leaving. Many of them have no plans to return. In Alpercata, the mayor's office is the town's top employer. Almost 5% of the 162 employees at the office fled to the United States this year. Many are also taking their families. A U.S. asylum policy permits some nationalities, including Brazilians, to remain in the United States while they argue their claims. It is a legal process that can take years. A total of 99% of Brazilian families who were stopped at the U.S. southern border in fiscal year 2021 entered the country to argue cases in immigration court, CBP data show. Alpercata's schools have lost 10% of their 926 students so far this year, said the town's education secretary. Many of these families join Brazilian communities in Florida or Massachusetts. They are able to find some of the 10.4 million jobs currently unfilled in the United States. Jorge Estefeson is Alpercata's top sports official. We're scared that in the future, we're going to be an elderly city without young people, he said. Officials in the United States are also concerned. Most Brazilian migrants reach the United States through Mexico, where they enter as tourists without visas. Some go to Mexican border cities before turning themselves in to U.S. officials to claim asylum. The U.S. has been pressuring Mexico to stop permitting Brazilians to enter without visas to help stop their trip to the border. Last week, Mexico said that by mid-December it would require all Brazilians to have visas in order to enter Mexico. Such action has been effective at preventing immigrants from other countries from entering Mexico. But Brazil's weakened economy likely means people will continue to travel north, officials told Reuters. A strong U.S. dollar is also driving immigration. The dollar is up more than 50% against the Brazilian real since late 2018, when President Jair Bolsonaro was elected. Since Bolsonaro's election, the number of Brazilians detained at the southern U.S. border rose more than 3,500%. Brazilians living overseas are now sending $300 million to $400 million back home each month Central bank data found. The money is welcome, but Alpercata still faces a shortage of healthcare workers and engineers, said the town's mayor. Egnalda Oliveira works at a city school. She is also a single mother. She said the deaths of her husband and parents, along with a rise in inflation, have left her struggling to make enough money. If I could leave tomorrow, she said, I would. 
The American space agency NASA recently launched its DART spacecraft to test a method to defend Earth against threatening asteroids. NASA says the DART mission is also testing several new technologies. One of them is a propulsion system that gets power from the sun. The technology is called solar electric propulsion. Since the system uses solar power instead of fuel-based engines, it does not need large, heavy fuel tanks. If the technology is successful, it could help power a new generation of spacecraft. NASA officials have said solar electric propulsion can be important to the agency's plans for future exploration. This could include planned missions to take astronauts to the moon and Mars. The solar-powered system included on the DART mission is known as Next C. It was developed by NASA's Glenn Research Center in Ohio, and built by rocket maker Aerojet Rocketdyne. The technology is based on systems used on NASA spacecraft in the past. That carried out asteroid exploration missions. Scientists working on Next C development said the new system is expected to be about three times as powerful as ones used in the past. Most propulsion systems use fuels to produce chemical reactions to provide thrust, moving the spacecraft. Next C is a propulsion system that uses electricity to convert xenon gas into xenon ions. As the ions are released, they provide the force to move the spacecraft. Large solar collectors produce electricity from sunlight. Next C is not the main propulsion system for DART. It was included in the mission to test its effectiveness. However, the technology will be the main propulsion system for the upcoming NASA mission called Psyche. The Psyche spacecraft will travel to a metal asteroid orbiting the Sun between Mars and Jupiter. NASA says it expects to launch Psyche in August. The spacecraft is to travel about 2.4 billion kilometers over three and a half years to reach the asteroid. Once in orbit, the mission team will examine data gathered by Psyche's science instruments. Scientists believe the asteroid may be part of the metallic core of an early planet. They say the asteroid could have separated during violent crashes that happened during our solar system's early formation. NASA says once Psyche separates from its launch vehicle, it will depend on solar electric propulsion to reach its target. The spacecraft is also expected to get a gravitational push. When it passes by Mars, the space agency says Psyche will be the first spacecraft to use the solar propulsion thrusters beyond the orbit of our moon. NASA describes the thrust as gentle, but strong enough to propel the spacecraft on its long trip. NASA said testing has shown that the system is highly effective. Scientists estimate that Psyche's thrusters could operate for years without running out of fuel. Linda Elkins Tanton of Arizona State University 
is a NASA investigator and leads the Psyche mission. Even in the beginning, when we were first designing the mission in 2012, we were talking about solar electric propulsion as part of the plan, she said in a statement. Without it, we wouldn't have the Psyche mission. Paolo Lozano directs the Space Propulsion Laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He told MIT Technology Review that he thinks Psyche can help create a path to new solar-powered space exploration. The technology could permit longer and less costly missions. It actually opens up the possibility to explore and to commercialize space in a way that we haven't seen before, Lozano said. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the years just after the Civil War, America was led by Andrew Johnson. The Democrat rose from vice president to president when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. Andrew Johnson soon found himself in a bitter struggle with Congress. In 1868, radical members of the Republican Party held a trial in the Senate. They tried to remove the president from office. But they could not prove their charges, and their effort failed by one vote. When the trial was over, Johnson had less than a year left in office. He retired to his home in Tennessee. By then, Americans had elected a new president. Larry West and Shep O'Neill tell the story of the election of 1868. There was no question about the Republican choice for president. Party leaders wanted General Ulysses Grant. Grant had been head of the Union Army during the last part of the Civil War. Under his leadership, the Union had won. And now he was the best-liked man in the country. Wherever Grant went, Former soldiers waited to shake the hand of the man who had led them to victory against the Confederacy. The Democratic Party had a much more difficult time choosing a candidate for president in 1868. Forty-seven men wanted the nomination. After several votes during its convention, the party failed to choose one above the others. Finally, party leaders looked for a compromise candidate. They chose Horatio Seymour, a former governor of New York State. He won the nomination on the 22nd ballot. Seymour, at first, said he could not accept the honor. He said he did not want to be president. But finally, after much urging from other party leaders, he agreed to run against Grant. The presidential campaign was a strange one. Neither Grant nor Seymour campaigned very hard. Grant told his advisors he would take no part in the election campaign. Seymour spent much of the time working on his farm. 
The real campaigning was done by party supporters. Republicans urged union men to vote as you shot for Ulysses Grant, the man who won the Civil War. They warned that Horatio Seymour and the Democrats were all secret rebels in their hearts. Seymour's supporters spent most of their time answering Republican charges. They struck back by accusing Grant of being a liar. They said he was controlled by extremists. They said he would rule from the White House like a dictator. The Democratic attacks failed. Grant got more popular votes and electoral votes than Seymour. He won the election. It was a great victory for the military hero. Yet it also was the start of an administration that would suffer many problems. Ulysses Grant would prove to be much less successful in politics than in war. As Andrew Johnson prepared to leave the White House a few months after Grant's election, he would look back on some successes during his time as president. True, he had lost the political fight to control the rebuilding or reconstruction of the defeated southern states, but he had won the equally important fight to keep the presidency independent from Congress. Johnson also could look back on some successes in foreign relations. During his administration, he got Napoleon III of France to withdraw French forces from Mexico, and he got more territory for the United States. In the spring of 1867, the Russian minister in Washington made a surprise offer. He said his country was willing to sell some of its territory in North America. Secretary of State William Seward quickly prepared a treaty accepting the offer. Russia wanted $10 million for the land. Seward said the United States would pay only $7 million. Russia accepted, and the treaty was signed. The United States flag was raised over Alaska. Many Americans protested the purchase of Alaska, they thought seven million dollars was too much to pay for a worthless piece of frozen land. They said the deal was foolish. They called it Seward's Folly. In time, of course, these critics were proved wrong. Alaska's wealth in oil, natural gas, trees, fish, and animal skins makes its purchase one of the greatest deals any country ever made for territory. On March 4th, 1869, Ulysses Grant traveled to Washington for his inauguration as the 18th President of the United States. Outgoing President Andrew Johnson refused to take part in the ceremony. Before Grant arrived, Johnson left the White House. As he walked out, he told a friend, I think I can already smell the fresh mountain air of my home in Tennessee. Americans had high hopes for their new president. They saw Grant as a strong and silent soldier, a great leader who had won a long and bitter war. But there was another side to Grant which most people did not see. During the Civil War, the general had been a great hero. For many years before that, however, he had been considered a failure. As a young man, Grant entered West Point, 
the nation's school for army officers. He did poorly in his studies. He did not like responsibility. Somehow he completed his studies and became an army officer. He fought in America's war against Mexico. After the war, Grant got into trouble. He drank too much whiskey, too often. The army forced him to resign. For the next eight years, he tried one thing after another. He failed at each one. He tried farming, for example, and failed. He tried selling land and failed at that too. At last, Grant appealed to his father for a job in a store. He held this low-paying job until the Civil War started. Then he finally got back into the army. He got his chance to succeed. Still, the years of poverty and failure affected Ulysses Grant. They made him lack trust in his own judgment and abilities. This feeling showed itself when Grant reached the White House. The new president had little knowledge of politics or government, and he refused to ask for advice from experts. To do so, he felt, would show a lack of intelligence. For advice, he depended on close friends. These were the men with whom he had served during the Civil War. Grant had never been able to make much money. He liked and had great respect for men who had. He became friends with some of these wealthy men. He accepted gifts from them. This weakness for money and power became clear when he announced his choices for his cabinet. Grant named a rich businessman to be Treasury Secretary. The Senate rejected him. Grant named another rich businessman for Navy Secretary. This nomination was approved even though the man had never been on a ship. Grant named several other rich people and old military friends to the cabinet. Many lacked political experience. Some critics attacked the appointments. One critic said, Never was an administration begun with more hope and less ability. The best advisor Grant named was John Rawlins as Secretary of War. Rawlins was a good judge of men, and he was wiser than most of Grant's other friends. He alone, of all those around the President, would argue with Grant when he believed him to be wrong. Rawlins, however, was in poor health. His condition grew worse during the summer of 1869. Early in autumn, he died. Rawlins' death hurt President Grant deeply. But the lack of honest, wise advice in the White House would hurt the country even more. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.